All right, welcome everyone, or she yo, as we've been saying, uh, which is hello in Cherokee, as we learned on our second adventure session with Cherokee Elder Gil Jackson. We're so excited to offer this adventure series geared, geared for young people, engaging for all ages. I'm Julie Judkins, Director of Education and Outreach with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And I'm here with my amazing colleagues on the line, Delia, Chloe, Alyssa, Catherine. And we've pivoted our regular education workshops for teachers and taken to a virtual hike up the trail. We started in Georgia with the science and habitats of rattlesnakes and are heading north to Maine, exploring different subjects connected to the trail in each state with local educators and partners and learning about flora, fauna, history, and culture. This week's hike, we're in Vermont and we'll be wandering through time and space with three amazing presenters, Nika Early Bird, John Megapod, and Rob Gaither, who will be taking us for a wild and varied adventure through the lenses of cosmic place, history, art, and physical and perceived time. So cool. These sessions are a resource for educators, for students, for parents and guardians, and anyone interested in learning more about these topics. Please check out the ones you may have missed on our YouTube channel, which can be found on our adventure page. So, um, just quickly, many of you know about the Appalachian Trail and that it's a unit of our national park system and a hiking trail that goes through 14 states from Georgia to Maine, built by volunteers, is taken care of by over 6,000 volunteers still today. Our organization, APC, is a nonprofit that works with hundreds of partners like the National Park Service or National Forest Service and all those volunteers to make sure it's an experience everyone can enjoy and learn from. We're so excited to have speakers through this adventure series tell us more about the different aspects of the trail, from hiking and history to recreation, plants and animals, and the powerful healing that can come from walking. So let me get to introducing our amazing instructors. Nika Early Bird Byers is an artist, an outdoor educator, and a through hiker who grew up in the hills of Vermont, nestled among fresh produce and hardwoods just a few miles from the AP. Inspired by curiosity, she is celebrated as a backcountry back caretaker, taught the wonders of the natural world, worked on trail crews, followed migratory birds to Costa Rica, has hiked over 10,000 miles across the United States on our national trail system. Her most recent wandering on the AT was setting the unsupported female fastest known time on the long trail, where time and space were experienced very differently than ever before. John Megapod Hansen is the principal of Barnard Academy, a small pre-K to grade six public school located just six miles from the AT. He's also a founding member of the Pemi Valley Search and Rescue Team in the White Mountains. Megapod's through hike took place in 88 when personal cell phones, GPS devices, and lightweight gear really just didn't exist. Finally, Rob Kaiser Hansen teaches sixth grade at Woodstock Elementary School, co-directs the Horizons Observatory, and has through hiked the Long Trail in 2016 and the John Muir Trail. Living within two miles of the AT, Rob loves roaming, running, and serving as an angel on the trail. Over the past 20 years, he's worked with Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Park, introducing young adults to the culture and beauty of Vermont's rivers and mountains. His wanderings will provide a perspective of the trail from a cosmic sense of place. So let's go wandering. Megapod, over to you. Thank you again, Julie, for the introduction. As she said, I am uh, John Megapod Hanson, Megapod as in big feet, size 15 to be exact. So there's a reason for that name. Um, so I threw hike when I was 27 years old back in 1988. Um, and this picture that you see on the screen um, of the tent with the moon and a candle lantern is from my second night on the trail in Georgia. So Nika, Rob, and I are here wandering the Appalachian Trail through time and space in Vermont, hoping to transport you to places um, and moments that are full of impermanence, wonder, and vastness. 
So we're a small state with only 150 miles of trail, but we're a good launch point for big ideas as any other place. Now, the star that you see in the center of Vermont uh, is uh, the approximate location of where Rob, Niki, Nika, and I sort of hang out, Palm Frit, Vermont. Right after you take a hard right turn in Killington on the AT, you run into Palm Frit pretty quickly after that. As it shows here, the elevation uh, of the AT in Vermont ranges from 400 feet to just over 4,000 feet when we talk about it in terms of the earth. But when you take it to the heavens, well, then we're talking light years. I'm gonna try to transport you with a down to earth tale twinged with sadness of a man and a dream. And that would be Benton Mackay, shown here, the young Benton and the older Benton. Some of you know that he is credited with developing the idea for the AT, and, and this was a big idea, a vast idea, a huge idea, 2,000 mile long trail. Um, certainly caused wonder uh, in the minds of many with this idea. Now, something about the young Benton Mackay, he describes school as a place that boys like to run away from. And that's what he did right after his father died. A little side note about his father, Steele Mackay. Steele died when Benton was 15 in 1894, but he also was a famous actor in his day and is credited with inventing the folding theater seat, which has been modified a little bit over the years. But uh, basically when you go to the theater and sit in a movie theater or, or any theater with a folding seat, he's the guy that came up with the idea. Full side note, but anyway, back to Benton. Benton studied on his own um, for a few years in order to take exams to get into Harvard College in 1896. This is a picture of what Harvard Yard looked like in 1896. While he was there, he met John Muir, the famous naturalist. Uh, some of you may have heard of the John Muir Trail in California. Um, Rob uh, Hansen hiked that trail just uh, a year or two ago, I think. Anyway, after graduating from Harvard in 1900, Benton took a hike. He went and climbed Stratton Mountain in Vermont. Now, Mackay himself says, quote, his dream may well have originated at the end of this hike to the peak of Vermont Stratton Mountain uh, for the AT. His idea for the AT started here. He climbed to the top of a tree for a better view and he wrote, quote, I felt as if atop the world with a sort of planetary feeling. Would a foot, footpath someday reach from where I was then perched? So that was in 1900. What happened for the 21 years between this, this first hatching of an idea atop Stratton Mountain and actually publishing his idea to the, to the wide world? Well, during those 21 years, Benton worked as a forester doing planning, uh, community planning, but he was also a political activist. Uh, believe it or not, he was a champion of women's rights and he happened to run into uh, a woman who was a suffragist, someone who works to allow more people to vote. Uh, that was Jessie Stubbs McKay. And you see her here with the circle around her, her head. Now, it turns out that, that Jessie liked long hikes and walks. And so at one point during her protesting, she organized a walk from New York City to Albany, a distance about 150 miles. And uh, she was one of only four people who made it the whole distance. So he was married for six years when on April 18th, 1921, while in New York City, Mackay's life took a very sudden turn. His wife ran from Grand Central Station, where they were about to take a train, and she went missing. And she was missing for several days, and she was later found in the East River, having jumped from a bridge to her death. Now, as you might imagine, Benton was devastated, absolutely devastated by this, um, heartbroken and despondent. And so some friends of his took him to their home and... Uh, while trying to help him uh, get over the death of his wife, 
they convinced him to write out his idea about the Appalachian Trail. He had talked about it for so long. They said, why don't you, you write this out? And so he did. And it was published in October of that year. Now, keep in mind, he wrote the idea that was published in 21. The trail as imagined then by him was finished in 1937. But the land that the Appalachian Trail is on, um, I think we still have a few pieces still to buy to, to get it all, but we're almost there. This is a picture I took in August of 1988 on Glastonbury Mountain in Vermont during my through hike. Benton Mackay would likely have crossed this mountain while he was hiking um, sometime during that period of time between Harvard and uh, uh, 1921 when he hiked the Long Trail. There are lots of pretty views, but I came to realize that the people I met were the best scenery. Now the guy with the circle around his head, that's me at 27. And this picture was taken near Bennington, Vermont in August, and we were celebrating the birthday of Papa Smurf. Now, can you guess which picture, person in this picture is Papa Smurf? Here's some other guys I met and noticed that they're, they're reading by candlelight. Again, in, in the introduction from Julie, she mentioned that we didn't have cell phones and things like that. Believe it or not, we didn't have headlamps either. And so we did a lot of reading in the shelter by candlelight. Now, there were a lot of characters on the trail. And this character from Australia finished the Appalachian Trail and then became instrumental in the development of the Bibbulmun Track in Western Australia, which was modeled after the AT. Here is Captain Kangaroo, I call it cooking socks in the 100 mile wilderness of Maine in September of 1988. He cleans up nicely, he, he looks a little different now. So here I am, I finished my hike in about six months and here I am at the base of Mount Katahdin on the morning of my final uh, hike. I guess you can guess what the temperature was that morning. And six months seemed like a long time and almost no time at all. So Rob Gazer Hansen, now he's gonna blow your mind about time and space as we continue our journey. Let's see if I can do a pass off to Rob here. Thank you, John. That was beautiful. So hello, I'm Rob Gazer Hansen. And for the past 30 years, I've been fortunate to teach at schools just a couple miles from the Appalachian Trail, uh, allowing me to lead students for hikes and trail work on our beautiful mid-Vermont section of the trail. I'm also co-director of the Horizons Observatory. I lead stargazing events and astrophotography sessions for students in the community. Thus, my trail name, Gazer. As John shared, the legacy of Benton Mackay, thousands of hikers, and the never ending work of thousands more who maintain and preserve the Appalachian Trail for those to come. In fact, all trail angels, past and present, is a precious and enduring gift to us and generations to come. For me, Benton Mackay's planetary feeling from atop Stratton Mountain is all about a sense of place that takes us beyond the artificial boundaries of states, countries, and yes, even beyond the confines of our planet. The trail provides us with the opportunity to experience both vast and intimate landscapes of the Appalachian mountain range and the communities surrounding the trail. And every once in a while, we walk out from beneath the foliage of the green tunnel to gaze upon mountain ridge upon ridge stretching to the horizon, standing beneath the sky, a sky whether by day or night that is as much a part of the AT as beech and maple, turtles and thrushes, rivers and mountains, and even the trail itself. When Mackay was asked what he thought was the purpose of the AT, he replied simply, to walk, to see, to see what you see. So I'd like to take a few minutes to gaze upward to get a sense of the vastness, not just of the Appalachian range, but far beyond the richness of our pale blue planet. To view our place from a height with such a perspective, we'll begin to have a sense as to where we really are to truly see what we see. I think Nika and her family will recognize this. 
This is the lookout in Bridgewater, Vermont, and we'll begin our journey on a summer's night. Imagine the flicker of a campfire on the trail, telling stories of our ancestors, of our present understanding of our place and our time. As the sun sets and the fire fades, darkness settles. Our pupils enlarge and hundreds, then thousands of stars begin to emerge. Think of it, this starlight is the only connection we have with the universe beyond our solar system and the only connection our ancestors had with anything beyond Earth. So let's take a journey, not step by step, but second by second at the speed of light, 186,282 miles per second or 5.89 trillion miles each year. And every so often pause and reflect on what science reveals about what we see. At one hundredth of a second, light second that is, we view the entire 2,190 miles of the AT from Springer Mountain, Georgia to Mount Katahdin, Maine. A tenth of a second, we see the entire western hemisphere of the earth. At 1.3 seconds, light seconds. We see our Earth from the perspective of the moon, here in phase, revealing day and night. This NASA photograph provides us with a remarkable Earth-bound perspective, revealing both beauty and illusion. Where size and distance come together, our moon's diameter measures 1 400th the diameter of the sun. But the moon is also 400 times closer to the earth than the sun, resulting in an equal apparent size. Take a moment with this 2013 photograph from the Messenger spacecraft at a distance of 5.1 light minutes from earth. What do you see? Can you make an inference about what is in front of you? This is indeed a view of our planet and its moon from the orbit of Mercury, just over five light minutes from Earth. At 8.3 light minutes from Earth, we arrive at our star, the sun, providing the energy for 99 plus percent of life on Earth via photosynthesis, driving our weather, the water cycles, in whose 27 million degree core, some of the most some of the fundamental elements needed for life, helium and nitrogen, oxygen, are forged in a process called nucleosynthesis. You may have noticed this distinctive black dot near the top of the sun. Take a moment. What might it be? This photograph was taken within a mile of the AT in Pomfret, Vermont, during the transit of Venus in 2012, where Venus passes directly in front of the sun as seen from the Earth, allowing us to see the relative size of Venus. But since Venus and Earth are nearly the same size, this image gives us an accurate idea of the size of our own planet compared with our star. But we're just beginning our journey. We move to 85 light minutes from Earth. and a very recognizable planet it is, about a billion miles from us, the beautiful ring planet Saturn. And this photograph looks back once again. That arrow points to a pale blue planet, our home, Earth, where all life we know emerged and evolved over some three billion years. Further yet, we move among the host of stars as seen from Earth, the Summer Triangle, two stars of which are relatively close to us, Altair at about 17 light years and Vega at about 25 light years. But here we experience the ever-present illusion of space as two-dimensional. The depth of multi-dimensional space is completely lost on us as is size and brightness. For the third star in the triangle, Deneb, is more than 100 times further from uh, than either Altair or Vega, and it um, is at a distance of about 2,600 light years. 
And to compound the illusion, Deneb appears to be just a typical star in our night sky, yet it's anything but that. Deneb is categorized as a white supergiant star whose light particles, photons, now reaching our eyes, left the star before the emergence of democracy in ancient Greece. And Deneb shined with luminosity at least 100,000 times that of our star, the sun. And its mass of 19 solar masses is destined to end its existence as a supernova explosion. Indeed, in the same constellation, uh, Cygnus the Swan is this object, the Veil Nebula. De Deneb's fate is much like the Veil because the Veil at one time was a supernova. And that star exploded about 8,000 years ago. Indeed, about one out of every 100 stars is a supermassive red or white giant. Within milliseconds, these stars explode with more energy than the combined stars of an entire galaxy of billions of stars. Such unfathomable energy converts iron into gold, gold into lead, and so on until uranium is forged, the heaviest naturally star-born element. Think of it. The elements of the Appalachian Trail, indeed our entire planet, with its plants, animals, mountains, even the oxygen that combining with hydrogen forms the water of rivers and lakes and oceans and polar ice. Yes, even the iron in the red blood cells flowing through your veins at this very moment are forged either in the core of stars like our sun or in the vast energies released in supernova explosions from massive stars like Deneb. In this way, Earth and the life it sustains, including us, are truly the stuff of stars. We now move beyond our own galaxy and to look back on our galaxy. Then this is the Milky Way galaxy. About 100,000 light years from Earth, we see the entirety of the Milky Way, a barred spiral consisting of about 200 billion stars. On the Milky Way's outer fringe lies an average yellow star we call the sun around which the planet Earth orbits. And in the background there, you see our sister galaxy. If you know just where to look, about two-thirds of the way between the constellations Cassiopeia and Andromeda, you can make out a faint, fuzzy patch of light, the furthest objects human, object humans can see with the naked eye. This is the great Andromeda galaxy, some 2.52 million light years from Earth. Imagine the light now reaching our eyes from Andromeda left that galaxy two and a half million years ago when Australopithecines roamed the Earth. So stargazing is the art, not only the art of looking into the depths of space, but into the depths of time. Still, Andromeda itself is but a cosmic stone's throw from Earth. Imagine this, hold a grain of sand on the tip of your finger at arm's length to cover a tiny portion of the night sky. To truly peer into the depths of cosmic space, astronomers use the Hubble Space Telescope to take an image after image of such a speck of sky. To produce this glorious photograph, nearly every glob and speck of light in this image is an entire galaxy, each made of hundreds of billions of suns. Multiply this speck over the entire sky, and we begin to get a sense of the immensity of the visible universe. Where stars are as numerous as grains of sand on every beach lining every continent of our planet. Time to come home. From galaxies blazing across the cosmos, we return to our beloved, beloved six inch by two inch blazes tracing out the AT. And here, uh, one of my students, Ane, is doing that blazing. It is here we find heaven is not only over our heads, but certainly under our feet. For it's with such cosmic perspective, we really begin to understand the preciousness of our planet. 
Over billions of years, life has co-evolved with Earth's elements and changing environments. Yet, as wondrous as the universe is, it's the amazing complex and living planet we inhabit that nurtures us in a way that's unlikely anywhere else in the vastness of the cosmos. So we Vermonters love our Appalachian Trail and Long Trail. We love to work them, as Nika is here working with Riley, another one of my students. We love to be silly on them, as we did in 2010 with this group and many times since on our sections of the AT in Vermont. And yes, we love to walk them. After gazing into the depths of the cosmos, we returned to no-name lookout to see ridge layered upon ridge of the Appalachians. But now we come back with a cosmic sense of place to really see what we see, to begin to glimpse how precious this place, our AT and our Earth really are. To share the third chapter of our, our Vermont Appalachian Trail story, I pass you on to Nika Myers, a native Vermonter who's experienced the wonder and vastness of the Appalachian Trail as few others have by through hiking not only the AT, but as you heard, the Pacific Crest Trail and the Continental Divide Trails. As a trail builder, an artist, an educator, the current holder of the fastest time known through hike Vermont's Long Trail, I can't hear that too many times, and someone immersed in the communities and cultures surrounding America's Long Trails, Nika will share her remarkable perspective, which begins, well, at a place a bit closer than Deneb, Andromeda, and the far-flung galaxies in the depths of space and time. Nika brings us back to a place called home. Thank you, Rob, that was wonderful. Thank you all for being here. And wow, my mind is so blown. <laughs> I don't know how I can follow that journey, but I'm going to attempt to. As a small child growing up, I considered a tiny part of planet Earth my home. This home was two miles from the Appalachian Trail in Bridgewater, Vermont, out in the woods, off of a dirt road, and away from any streetlights. Getting to town felt like an eternity, even in a car, but the forests and gardens and magic of the wild things filled my curiosity and wonder of time and space I lived in. The night sky would fill up the space between the huge hemlock tree, our house, the edge of the forest, at the end of the garden. The stars, the magic, the scariness, it was all there. It was full of dreams, questions, and the incomprehensible reality of distance. Growing up, we had the privilege of listening to bedtime stories where my twin sister, before my twin sister and I would go to sleep, and the stories would bring us to places far away where we knew nothing about. We were maybe running away from something, solving a problem, finding something special or saw something amazing. And there was fairies and elves and good guys and bad guys. And we were really uncomfortable at times or we were cozy at times. And I would try to put myself in their shoes and figure out what to do in the face of some of these challenges. Those characters still to this day, some written in books and some still made up, are some of the characters that fill my head while I'm hiking. And they give me the confidence to say yes to adventure and the knowledge that sometimes it's not always gonna be easy. And sometimes I look back on those characters and the good guys and the bad guys and I thank them because stories are so important and they have made me and so many others dream big. I didn't quite think that bedtime stories would become reading a map by headlight and falling asleep night after night in a different bed. Growing up, place was so attached to my home and my family in Vermont. My bed was safe and I didn't think I would ever be okay with not knowing where I was gonna sleep every night. And for me though, this was part of a dream and not forced upon me. When a friend told me they had hiked 30 miles on their first day of a through hike on the Appalachian Trail, my mouth dropped. I simply like could not fathom how someone could cover that much ground in a day, let alone someone I knew. Um, after college, I found myself working for the Green Mountain Club, the maintainer of the 272 mile long trail and the Appalachian Trail in Vermont as their group outreach and education specialist. 
the AT, there's a map, there's a, there's a map of the AT uh, <laughs> in Vermont. Um, and, uh, but the AT shares a hundred miles of the long trail from the Massachusetts border to around Killington. And I'm even growing up so close to the AT, I had no idea what through hiking was and what the community surrounding the trail was like. I had heard stories of the characters who had built the trail or simply loved the trail or knew someone who was connected to it. But I quickly realized as I was encouraging others to get out hiking and teaching Leave No Trace and doing trail work that I was no expert and I was completely learning by doing. But to call myself a Vermont or someone who was born and raised in the state, I didn't realize until after hiking the long trail in 2012, after working for a year for the Green Mountain Club, how much I didn't know about Vermont. I knew a small space really well, my home, but how the mountains transitioned from rocky summits to the spruce fir crumholtz to deciduous trees, or how the major rivers flowed through the narrow or wide valleys, and how the state looked from high up on a ridge line. It made me rethink my connection to place and the way I looked at the familiar. Concepts of conservation and the way humans had moved through the mountains and through time. And the people, the kindness and openness in, that I experienced was absolutely incredible. But also the confusion of why someone would want to hike in late October, early November. After hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in 2014 and the Continental Divide Trail in 2016, I walked back in the direction of home in Vermont, northbound on the Appalachian Trail. In 2018, um, to finish what is known as the Triple Crown of Hiking, the, the space between these steps were full of landscapes I didn't know existed. They were full of road crossings, property lines and signs, the smells and the sounds that always kept me company. And the feeling of stepping back in time, both as a child and in the greater sense. Here I am playing with my dinosaur gummies, but also pretending that I'm back with the dinosaurs. <laughs> and understanding the ways that the days fall into night and back into day and how hiking doesn't have to be within one or the other. And then the abstract numbers of miles that somehow relate to the time in my day and the weeks and the months of walking. But when I got to the end, a moment in time and space, I celebrated, reflected, and dreamed. But more than that, the AT was the best way to connect landscapes that were familiar with a knowledge and understanding of what walking across the United States brings. It was humbling and wild. Yet the distance of walking over 7,000 miles still seemed super abstract. I wanna take you back to what it felt like when walking a mile was the biggest challenge and carrying a backpack was so cumbersome and irritating. Was it just for the snacks or was it for water? Like, when would we get there? Do some of you feel like that now when you go hiking? <laughs> The diameter of Earth is roughly 8,000 miles. And since 2012, when I was 23, my legs have carried me over 10,000. Thinking about the distance in relationship to walking makes the world seem actually quite small. If a little girl from Vermont can walk the diameter of an Earth, of our Earth, surely a mile wouldn't feel super hard. But I also had a new curiosity of how my body would move through space combined with my absolute love for Vermont and connection to the hiking community. And it led me to dream to hike across the state from Canada to Massachusetts and set a fastest known time. It was a way of experiencing time and space different than I ever had before. And it would be an honor to follow in the footsteps of so many amazing people who had paved the way for that journey but would a mile still feel overwhelming? But on September 26th uh, at 10, 4.10 in the morning under a cloudy sky, I stepped and set out from the US-Canada border. The beginning of the trail felt like I was flying. I was so happy to have the opportunity and the people who were believing in me from afar. However, on day three, distance was becoming a bit abstract. 
25,000 feet of elevation change. What does that feel like? It wasn't about how many miles I could hike in a day, but how many hours I simply was willing to walk. The landscape started to shift and the mental mind games came into play and it was a totally different space to navigate. The darkness and mist closed in strong. The combination that made using a headlamp almost counterintuitive. The light's reflection off the mist limited my vision to just a few feet. The flat terrain was filled with puddles and mud. I couldn't see and the pain in my feet was crippling. But at the top of Mount Ellen in the darkness of a wide ski trail, I got totally turned around and headed in the wrong direction. And when I realized my mistake, I just didn't have the energy to be frustrated. I accepted the fact that no matter how much I focused on what I was doing wrong, I had to remind myself that this was hard, but it was a choice that I made. Like some of those characters, I wasn't running away from something. I was hiking towards a big dream. I reminded myself that when I look up at the moon, people all across the country, my family and my friends were also there in the light and maybe seeing that what I was seeing. And on day five after rain and wetness and I reached the AT and it was surprisingly so easy to stay 100% in the moment and not let my mind drift to memories of such a special place. I was so close to where I grew up and so close to so many important memories. And when I reached the small 100 miles left marker out of Mount Ashberries, the miles felt more abstract than ever. 100 miles of this journey felt like a thousand. And those 100 miles would be some of the hardest, most challenging I had ever hiked. Not in terms of terrain, but in terms of my mental and physical state. There's a picture of a small salamander that is not showing up, but it is a creature that I met on my last night. And I wondered how long it would take that little creature to hike the long trail. And I thought we were pretty similar. Slow, very wet, and wearing yellow and black. The small space that marks the end of the long trail and marks about 1600 miles of the AT is about 10 square feet of planet Earth, but it is full of memories. On October 2nd, 2019, after hiking through fall magic and wild ruggedness, I finished the long trail and set the unsupported female record in six days, 11 hours and 40 minutes. But to say I was unsupported is silly in the sense that I 100% couldn't have done it without the love and inspiration and encouragement from so many incredible people. But it does mean that I carried all of my food and supplies from the beginning and didn't accept any help from along the way. But when thinking about light speed versus my speed, man, am I slow. Man, I would make it. <laughs> there are experiences though, I wanna encourage you to think about how you wanna share stories. For me, trying to share moments that are not written in words, but expressed through paintings and drawings gives me more freedom to continue to explore those experiences. Lines and shapes find their way into creating links to places that may not be seemingly connected. Links, landscapes are in relationship to one another, seen in our memories, but maybe not in our photographs. It helps me to tell stories, support conservation projects and advocate for public spaces. There's no what, one way to fully recreate a sunrise dancing across a high ridge or the emotion that comes from being present from a miracle or the complete gratitude for having just an unforgettable conversation. But I strive to bring parts of that energy into my work. And I think of the trail experience, one of the first things I think about are the tracks that are made in sand, mud, and snow. They're representative of our, my friends or other hikers ahead. And the little triangles that leave behind are embedded in my trail memories. The little triangles that find their ways into the paintings, the mud, the dirt, the sand, getting thrown up into the air, a little fracturing of the surface that we're treading on. For the last slide, a painting of the AT, to think about our relationship to time and space is a wild challenge. 
to contextualize ourselves in history, to walk across Vermont or hiking 2,100 miles from Georgia to Maine, it is hard to comprehend, let alone the distance to the Milky Way. We want to encourage you to explore not just the mountains, hills, sidewalks, parks, and forests, but also the deep time, the wild night sky, and your own personal story with your own space and time. Thank you so much for joining us on our journey this evening and to the Appalachians Trail Conservancy for giving us this opportunity to share our stories of the impermanence, wonder, and vastness. We want you to stay on for a little bit um, for our Q&A. Um, and we welcome your uh, questions to the, to the presenters at this time. If you want to put a question that you have in the Facebook feed or in the Zoom, we welcome them. It's really so cool to me to see the beauty of the Appalachian Trail and its power to connect and weave us together from education and stewardship to stars and space and the ability to take inspiration and represent it through alluring and phenomenal art like Mika's. question about the giant, um, I guess it's the telescope in Pomfret. Is that open to the public and can they check it out or does it have to be by invitation? Not by invitation. Um, there is a website called the Horizons Observatory. If you Google in the Horizons Observatory Vermont, you'll come to our website and it shows, um, and on that, there's a blog. You go to the blog and it will announce different presentations. We've had a little snafu these last few months. Um, don't know what's going on, but we haven't been able to uh, gather people in small observatory spaces for a while. So that may sound too familiar to you. Uh, so we're on a little bit of a hiatus, like much of the planet is. But we will be gearing up with presentations um, when we kind of move through this piece. So it's 14 inch um, reflector scope and we have stargazing parties there and do astrophotography and everyone is welcome. Rob, I had a question when you, I think it was when you showed the image of the earth as seen from Saturn's rings, you referred to it as blue. And I wondered if it actually has a blue tint when you see it from another planet. Yeah. Uh, now, I have not been to other planets uh, lately, but I've seen photographs from other planets. And actually, you know, the famous um, person who popularized astronomy big time, uh, Carl Sagan, he wrote a book called Pale Blue Dot. And of course, he was talking about our planet. And indeed, um, most of the Earth is ocean and you it's a pale blue that you see from from space. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Got a quest question to you on what was your favorite trail snack? Oh, that's a really hard, hard question. Um, one of my favorite trail snacks is potato chips, um, salt and vinegar, preferably. Um, also any gummies, um, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty standard. But then you get into like the pastries and you know, all the other things you start wanting to crave. Are you willing to share how you covered the cost of hiking the Triple Crown? So long and the short of it, I, I worked seasonal jobs. Um, we worked for the Green Mountain Club. They were incredibly supportive of me going and hiking trails. Um, surprisingly, no. <laughs> um, I, I also um, worked for my family's restaurant and I lived really simply and prioritized that uh, on trail. I also um, just... Uh, I didn't, I like drink alcohol for most of my Appalachian Trail hikes because that's an expensive cost in town. So I preferred to drink, eat pastries, which is classic, but maybe not like a through hiker um, all the time. There's definitely a drinking scene. Uh, I don't know, I just, um, I, I think I just didn't have to pay for housing for a lot of those years because I lived in a tent, even with work. Um, so that was a huge, and then my family is like the most incredibly supportive family I could possibly imagine. And they let me also come and live with them uh, for periods of time during that time, <laughs> uh, which I'm grateful for. Everybody, please join me in thanking our speakers. 
That was a beautiful presentation from each of you.